for those Thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Alyssa. I'm the National Treasurer of SAVMA, and I've got a few speakers with me here today. And I'll actually let them all introduce themselves before they start talking um, because they're given different presentations at different points of this time period. So, um, Dr. Cologne, if you want to go ahead and get started, um, you should be able to share your screen. I'll make sure. Um, yeah, you should be able to share at this point. Okay. Glenn, I can see you, my screen there. Thanks. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Sabma, for having me here tonight with my other two co-hosts for tonight. My name is Jorge Colon. I'm a equine veterinarian by training, but I also have an MBA and an interest in finance. And I had a 25-year practice in Lexington, Kentucky as an equine ambulatory practitioner, but I came back to Cornell in 2020 to develop and implement a new veterinary business educational curriculum at Cornell. So I've been uh, in academia since 2020. I'm an associate professor of practice. And today I was going to want to talk to you guys a little bit about interest related to student loans, um, what compounding interest is, and the importance in my view of early career investing and how this associates with your student loans and with interest. And I think this ties up, if I understand correctly, with a previous talk you guys have had about student loans. So I'm going to try to present some material. Uh, hopefully this opens up for questions. I'm not a financial planner. I'm not a financial aid person, but I have an interest in this and I'll answer any question that I can to the best of my abilities. So when you're gonna be talking about interest, there's two types of interest that we need to talk about. If we're gonna be talking about interest related to student loans, we're gonna be talking about something called simple interest. And that's interest that gets calculated on the principal amount that you owe only. Whatever amount of interest you have accrued during your time of your school education, that does not accrue any more interest, only, print, only the principal accrues interest. Compounding interest on the other hand is interest that accrues on not only principal that you have that you owe to somebody else, but on any interest that has already accrued. So it accrues interest on interest. So what is interest? Interest is if I'm the lender and you were the borrower, I have a risk when I lend you the money. The first one that should come to mind is the fact that you won't pay me back. There's many other different reasons why there's risk associated with this. So interest is the charge I'm gonna charge you in exchange for you borrowing my money. And so the more, um, risk worthy that you are, the less interest you're going to pay, the more risk unworthy that you are, or the more risky that you are, the more interest you're going to have to pay for a loan. So student loans, like I just said, are going to be accruing a simple interest. Um, student loans accrue on a daily basis. Uh, the time, the number of periods per year that a loan accrues will make a difference in the compounding interest, not in the simple interest. But student loans, accumulate interest on a daily basis. And the amount that you're gonna owe at the end of your loan borrowing period is gonna be equal to the amount borrowed plus any interest that has accrued. The topic of subsidized versus unsubsidized student loans comes into mind. If you have a subsidized student loan that accrued interest is gonna be paid by the federal government, most of you are gonna have unsubsidized interest loans. So at the end of your educational period, you're gonna owe not only the money that you borrowed, or any interest that has accrued. And the mathematical formula for doing this is fairly simple. The accrued interest is equal to the principal balance. And every single loan that you have is gonna have a different APR or an annual percentage rate. Or annual percentage rate. And that rate, because there's 365 periods in a year, that rate gets divided by 365. And then that gets multiplied by the number of periods. So one year will have 365 periods. Etc. So that will give you the amount of the accrued interest. If you add that to the amount that you borrowed, then that's how much you owe. Because of COVID, we have something called the CARES Act, and the CARES Act is something beneficial for you. In uh, March 13th of 2020, the interest rate of student loans, no matter what your previous interest rate was, if this is a federal unsubsidized student loan, I'm not talking about any personal loans, 
but any federal loan, the interest rate went down to zero. And that will remain, as of today, it will remain like that until May 1st of 2022. So if you, for example, had a $35,000 loan at 6.08 APR that you took out on 8 2019, because I was talking to some of my students about this, then I can tell you that I can tell Excel how many days are there between 8 2019 and 3 13 20, and that number of days is 206 days. So there are 206 periods in this time that I'm calculating, and I have a loan that has an APR of 6.08%. There are 365 accruing periods in a year. And if I do this math, then the amount of interest that this loan has accrued between this time period is about 1,200 bucks. Because of the CARES Act between 31320 and today, the number of days, if I ask Excel how many days in between these two dates, it's going to tell me there's 713 days, again, 365 compounding periods per year, but the rate is zero. And because of that, the interest that you have accrued during this time period between 313 and today is zero. So the amount that this loan would have owed is the amount that you borrowed, 35 grand, plus the interest that has accrued because there was no interest between uh, March 13th and today, you don't have that interest. If for some reason you wanna calculate how much is gonna be until what your graduation day is, then you can look at any time between 5 one as long as the CARE, our CARES Act parameters don't change between now and then, they changed twice, at least twice over the last year. So any loan that you have on the student side will give you a grace period where interest will still get calculated in a simple fashion, but six months after the day of your graduation. So whatever your graduation day is, add six months to that, and between 5 one and uh, 22 on that day, you can figure out as Excel how many days is that. You can do the mathematical formula, and this is the additional interest that you would have to add to what you already have owed. So you will start paying interest again after 5 1. So this is how your student loan works. The, what happens with your student loan when it ends is that the interest gets added to your principal, it gets capitalized and therefore added to your principal. And now you have a loan, if this were your number, that you have a loan that you owe back. 36,201 and change. And the way that this loan gets paid off is based on something called compounding interest. It will switch to a compounding interest loan. And any compounding interest loan has three main things that are extremely important for you to understand. There's a yearly rate like the APR, same thing as a simple interest loan, for example, that I'm giving you here, 5%. The frequency of accrual periods is the number of periods in a year. You can have it monthly, you can have it daily, you can have it quarterly, you can have it one time a year. And the duration is going to be the number of periods, not the number of years, but the number of periods. And the number of periods are going to be dependent on how many years and how many periods per year. So if you have a loan that's accruing interest in a monthly fashion, and it's going to be a loan for three years, there are 36 monthly periods in three years. So these three parameters are extremely important to estimate anything related to compounding interest. The compounding interest scenario is gonna be dictated by the most important fact in finance, which is the time value of money concept. And the time value of money concept says that a dollar on hand today is worth more than that same dollar in the future. The first thing that you should think about is inflation. If you have $100 and you can buy something with $100 today, probably a year from now, that $100 will not buy the exact same thing because that thing will cost more than $100. So inflation eroded the purchasing power of that dollar. So the time value of money concept says that the present value of something today, if you grow it through some percentage rate over a specific amount of time, then you gotta have a different value in the future. And so it's similar to the simple interest formula except that we are multiplying the present value or the current value by the interest rate. We're gonna still divide it by the number of periods, but it's exponentially raised to the number of compounding periods. We're not multiplying by the compounding periods, we're elevating to the power of. If I have $100 and it grows by 5% one time a year, I'm gonna have 105 at the end of one year. But if I'm gonna grow that 105 to another 5%, that I'm gonna have 105 times 1.05, and then I can see what it's gonna be for year two. 
So the mathematical formula for that is fairly simple to understand. And if I see an example of $5,000 that I have 10% APR accruing monthly for 20 years, I'm gonna see the number of periods that I have per year are 12. This is my interest rate per year, but the number of periods now is gonna be the 20 years times 12 periods per year. And I'm elevating this whole thing to the power of. And when I do that, I see that $5,000 over 20 years at 10% accruing monthly will probably be worth about 36,000 and change 20 years from now. So that's what the time and value money concept tells you. You can go forward with this. You can go backwards. You can go forward to find a future value. You can go backwards to find a present value. But the other thing that the time value of money does is it provides something called payments. And payment is something that you will use during an amortization schedule. And the payment schedule is one I'm going to be using to pay off a loan. If you're going to be paying off a loan, obviously you have a current present value of some amount. This is the amount that you have borrowed. The future value that you want to have is obviously zero because you want to pay it off. So I did some calculations for you. And for example, if you have a loan amount of $150,000, a 5% APR uh, compounding monthly over 10 years, if you put that into any mortgage calculator on the internet, you will see that your monthly payment needs to be $1,590.98. If you pay this amount monthly, once a month for 10 years, you will have paid off and taken that $150,000 down to zero. Very important for you to understand that whatever loan you have, whether a simple interest loan or compounding interest loan, any payment that you make to that loan, the amount that you pay will always go to the interest that you owe first. And anything that's remainder will then go to your principal. Amortization schedule, this amount that you will do monthly already pre-calculates the amount that will go to interest and the amount that goes to principal so that when you keep paying this off over time, you will pay the loan off. In this student loan scenario, there's the scenario of, if you were to have a standard repayment plan, I'm sorry, this is the scenario that we have. A standard repayment plan will take the amount of money that you owe at the end of that six month grace period, grace period after graduation, and you will have a 10 year monthly payment to pay off that loan. The other option that you guys have is the income-based repayment plans. And an income-based repayment plan is going to present a scenario where you're going to more likely than not have a payment that will be lower than your standard repayment plan. And the reasons for that is if your income does not allow for you to pay whatever your monthly payment would be under a standard plan, which is going to be over 10 years. So there's three different scenarios associated with this payment. You can make a payment that covers the interest and pays off the loan in less than 20 years. So it took you longer than 10, it took you less than 20. So what you did is you took care of your obligation, you paid off the whole loan, and what you ended up doing is just paying more interest over time, but you still got your loan paid off. The second scenario is you make a payment that covers your interest, but your loan is not yet paid off by 20 years. Income-based repayment plan, when done properly, that amount that you still have owed at 20 years is something that you try to go for loan forgiveness. That's a topic for a different conversation. But this is the second scenario. You make a payment. Obviously, it's lower if you don't pay off the whole loan by 20 years and you have an amount that can be forgiven. The third scenario is that you make a payment that does not cover interest. And if you don't cover interest and every payment is going towards interest, but you're not covering all of it, then you're not touching any of your principal. And in fact, if there's any interest remaining, you're actually growing your principal. So you can end up with a loan that at 20 years is actually at a greater amount than what you started with. Obviously, you will have an amount that you will be looking for loan forgiveness, but this is a scenario, scenario C, where you would not be able to pay this loan ever in the future because you will never have paid enough against that loan. Understanding that the income-based repayment plans change the amount of money you're going to be paying against your loan, but these provide. The other thing that we need to talk about is early career investing. And the scenario that I discuss with my students at Cornell is the fact of how do I invest money when I'm young in my career if I have student debt that I need to take care of? So let me talk to you first about why it's important for early career investing. First, any money that you contribute to a 
tax deferred retirement plan will reduce your taxable income. So it will reduce the amount of personal income taxes that you will pay. Most often than not, if I am negotiating or looking at your contract to help you negotiate, I'm gonna be looking for you to have a contract that offers an employer matching. And employer matching is nothing other than free money that goes into your account for it to grow over time. And investment into retirement accounts will grow in a compounded fashion and it'll be tax-free until the day that you withdraw that money. So you get to keep more of that money into that account compounding over time. So as an example in this graph that I'm giving you, it's the same scenario. Somebody who has $110,000 salary, they're gonna to decide to put a 5% contribution into their account. So they're gonna be about $5,500 uh, per year. They're, that's going to elicit a $3,000 match from their employer. So now they're putting $8,500 towards their retirement account once a year. Uh, I found a, a calculation for you on the 8% APR accruing interest yearly. The blue line represents the value of that money at age 64, age 65. If you started investing at 25 years of age, which the majority of you are somewhere in that range, you're going up somewhere in the 2.2, 2.3 million dollar range. If you wait 10 years until you take care of your student loans and you start investing the same amount with the same matching, but you don't start until age 35, by the time that you're in your 64, 65 year range, you're going to be a little bit less than a million dollars. So the difference is fairly drastic just because you started investing 10 years earlier. So this is the importance for, me for you to start investing early. I'm gonna give you a scenario that I presented for you, letting you know why you should be able to do both. If I take those $5,500 that I just presented in the previous case, and instead of using them for the retirement, I use them to pay additional $5,500 to the principal against that student loan that I presented you earlier. I did some calculations for you and you will have paid off that loan in about seven and a half years. So the actual cost of those extra payments, you would have put down 39,875 additional. So it's not 5,500 times 10 because you're gonna pay it off in, in less than 10 years. But I'm going to assume that based on you being single and you being on the salary range we put you on the 24% tax bracket today, that would actually cost you about $9,500 in taxes because you need to pay federal taxes on that money. And over that seven and a half years, it would have been about $9,500. So the total cost of those extra payments, it would actually have cost you about 49 and a half to make those 39,000 in extra payments. Now in doing that, you would have saved interest because you paid your loan earlier. And the amount that you would have saved over about seven and a half years would have been about $11,600. So I can calculate that the actual cost of those extra payments to you was somewhere around $37,800. So this is the benefit that you got out of putting $5,500 in additional principal per year towards your loan to pay off sooner. Obviously, you must have the additional cash to be able to do this. But if we're going to say that you cannot put money towards your retirement because you need to put the money towards your loans, then I need to do a calculation for you where you actually put it against your loans. So that's what I did here for you. And the second part, instead of putting that money towards the loan, I put it over towards our retirement account. So when you pay, when you put money into your retirement account, obviously the amount that you put in reduces your taxable income. The matching amount that your employer puts in has nothing to do with your taxable income. So when you do that, you reduce that amount of money that's paying 24% tax because you're going to be at that tax rate more likely than not. So you will have reduced your tax of your taxes by about $9,500. So the actual cost of those contributions would have been about 30 grand. The difference between these two scenarios is related to the compounding value of money through time value money concept. You would have over that amount of time, you have received around 22 grand from your employer in free matching in, in the form of that scenario that I just presented for you. And if I grew that money properly, through a time value money calculation, you would actually have about $989,000 $989, in your retirement account. So the scenario that I present to you is that you need to strongly consider if you have the ability to provide additional money into something when you're in your young years, I understand why the push for you to try to reduce this interest amount so you can pay off your loan sooner, but I'm going to be a huge proponent that you always think about the value of that future account the day that you turn 65 
because having 989 grand in that account in exchange for the saving of $11,000 in interest, to me, I would put this option. So anytime you're gonna be a, uh, in a scenario of being able to contribute to the retirement account versus paying to your loans when you're young in your career, please make sure that you consider the aspect of contributing to your retirement account, not only because of the free money you're gonna get it for your employer, but the effect of compounding growth over time. So this is a very simple, very fast introduction to interest and compounding interest. Questions that you guys have, the three of us presenting today. So I just wanted to finish with that. I wanna thank Sabma for inviting me to talk to you guys tonight, and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation tonight. Thank you. Awesome. I think I'm supposed to take over. So um, George, can you see me okay? Let me see if I can share my screen here. Can you see that? Yes. Awesome, perfect, thanks. Um, great, so uh, again, my name is Glenn Sellers. I am at Auburn University. Um, I've been here about 25 plus years. Uh, I started off um, working in anesthesia with a master's in biomedical sciences, worked through an MBA, currently working on a PhD, looking at uh, rural practice medicine and profitabilities in those areas. Um, so I've been lucky to kind of get here and, and kind of a lot like Dr. Clone, um, been working on um, really a business curriculum here for our students. Um, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about the negotiations. I'm gonna focus the majority of, of my time on that. Um, try to keep it as short as I can. Um, I'm, that's gonna lead us into a little bit of discussion on contracts. And I thought I'd just tie it together with a flash on a paycheck so you guys can think a little bit about uh, where your money's going. How does that kind of break down? So um, first thing I want you guys to think about, um, and I always kind of teach our students here, is you have to look at economic conditions before you, you kind of have to prepare your negotiations and know what's kind of going on. Um, and in, in this case, we're going to be talking a little bit more toward our salaries. And so how, how do we look at that and, and what drives those salaries um, in a veterinary practice? Um, when you think about that, it all kind of revolves to me around the state of the economy. And I think it's a good idea to, to enter these negotiations by knowing kind of what's going on in the world and what's important to these business owners um, and what drives their profits in their clinic. You have to look to see what's going on in the market. You have to understand what employment numbers and how that's trending as well. Um, you have to look at consumer spending and consumer confidence. I mean, these consumers, these pet owners are what's driving and how they're going to spend money in the clinic. That is going to tie in to a lot of us when it comes to production-based pays and how we generate revenue. Um, and then you have to look at things like GDP. Again, all these things kind of tie together. So I really can't, I just always feel I'm doing an injustice if I don't throw that one slide out there and make sure that we're looking at all these things and thinking about these things. So to tie this in now to negotiations, you know, what are we looking at? And this is one thing that, that my students here often just, they just don't feel comfortable with negotiating. Uh, it's just it's just an awkward feeling. And, and when you think about it, what is it? It is nothing more than a discussion aimed at reaching an agreement. It's, it's pretty simple. Y'all negotiate every flipping day, whether you realize it or not. I tell my students all the time, life is one big negotiation. OK, we may be looking right now and I'm going to be looking for a job. I'm going to be out there. So it's going to be me with an employer. Well, yeah, that's an, a negotiation. But you're going to be a veterinarian in the exam room. You're negotiating with clients. You, uh, I joke with my students, I go into Publix and negotiate with the person at the fish and meat counter. Uh, I mean, I, I love it. It's, it's everywhere when you think about it. When you look at the process of negotiation, there's four basic steps. Preparation, which is the biggest one as far as I'm concerned. You have to understand what's kind of going on and prepare. Opening, bargaining, and closure. And the closure is where it leads into the letter of intent and the contract, okay? So as I said, preparation to me is always the most important phase. I teach my students here, expect two minutes of prep for every minute in a negotiation. Well, Glenn, how, if I'm negotiating a job and I'm interviewing uh, and I interview for four or five hours, are you telling me that I got to prep for eight? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Well, Glenn, what? What am I preparing for eight hours? I mean, what is that about? You have to know pay structures. You have to understand the compensation equation, as I call it, how that works in a clinic. 
You should know your worth. You need to know your needs and your wants. You need to understand what the budget, you, you have to look at these things to have that educated conversation when you're sitting across the table from that owner and you're, or you're in that veterinary clinic. Um, if not the owner, two or three words in that negotiation can send it right down the tubes. He'll know that you're, you're not really up to speed on these things. Um, and again, we're talking about owner scenarios. I'm telling you, this is just life. You're buying the, a practice in the future. You're buying property. You're buying a house. Be, again, y'all, life is one big negotiation, okay? So think about that when you look at it and you start thinking about negotiations from your personal perspective in this job, you know, employee-employee relationship as you go in there. The first thing I encourage you guys to study is your budget. And I, I spend one, two lectures just talking about how to put a budget together and how they work. Within that, you need to understand what your wants and your needs are. And you can't even begin to talk about salaries. You can't go into a job. You can't do these things if you don't know where you stand. I tell my students all the time, you must own your financial future. And in doing so, you get your budget, put that stuff together so you know where you are. Then you got to know what you're worth. Some of us are probably thinking, Glenn, we're students, we're young associates, you're going to be. We're not worth a whole lot, but you are. And how do you calculate that? Especially right now, you guys are worth a ton to these veterinary practices. They're trying to hire everywhere. Okay, so no, what am I worth? Can I put a figure on that? Of course you can. What can you produce? What do you bring to the table? Those are all things that you can calculate uh, your worth. And you think about that with regards to how does that tie into a pay structure? A lot of the pay structures that are out there now are, are gonna be based on production. You guys have heard that, production-based pays. Okay, and I'm not, again, that's a lecture for a whole nother day. Um, you can do straight salary as well. Um, so some of you are thinking, well, Glenn, I, you know, production isn't a big thing. I don't have to worry about what I'm producing. Think again, because that all goes back to a compensation equation. The owner knows if he's going to hire you, he's gone back to figure out what he can pay you based on what you generate for the practice. I don't care whether you're producing to figure that out or whether it's a straight salary. The owner knows that. You should be educated on how that calculation works so that you can work that into the equation as well. So again, even if you say I'm on a straight salary, please don't think that an owner isn't watching to see how much you're producing in his practice or her practice. He's watching it, okay? And that's gonna come up at your yearly evaluation. You know, you generated this, you, you didn't. For those of us two or three years out down the road, again, knowing what you're worth, knowing what you produce is how you're gonna have that discussion on my raise down the road, okay? And when I talk about the compensation equation, this one here, we always want to focus on a salary, and that is extremely important. But what else is in that equation for compensation? Because that compensation isn't the compensation and salary are two different things. Salary is part of your compensation or your compensation package at a veterinary practice. So you need to be thinking about the benefits, health insurance. You need to be thinking about dental, vision. You need to be thinking about CE. You need to be thinking about vacation. All these are part of the compensation package. So when I sit down and I talk to students with their contracts, we have a spreadsheet. We spend 40 minutes probably talking about salary and calculations and pay structures. But the other part of that is, well, what are they helping you out on the other side of this equation? And, I'm, and, and even for me with my students, they'll look and be like, well, Glenn, I don't know. I didn't talk about that. Well, you need to, because based on the numbers that I run with half of my students in my fourth year class and their contracts, that's anywhere between 10 and $20,000 you're leaving on the table. You know, Dr. Colon talked about retirement, 401ks, they match three, they match four. Now the terminology gets even more fine-tuned, which they're gonna pay 1% of the full 3% that you've been. You've gotta understand how that equation works to have that educated conversation and negotiate that in that practice. So I think we can go back and start thinking, wow, yeah, two minutes for every minute and I need to know just that stuff. It takes time to gather that information. I'll also tell you too, as we, and we're going to get into this some more in this little cat mouse bullet down here toward the bottom. In order to have this conversation with them, you need to know um, you don't want to back yourself in the corner. You need to know that, you, and you don't want to come across saying, well, I think I'm worth $120,000. You need to leverage that against what does the AVMA say? What are other websites saying that are, are going great right, right now? for young associates getting started out there, okay? Um, you need to be doing that research to have that conversation as you prepare for this negotiation. 
The clinic perspective is another thing that you want to look at and think about. Practice philosophies in the clinic. What's the feel of that clinic? Are you going to negotiate mentorship in that clinic? Um, I see a lot of people work that compensation equation. They'll give up um, a good bit of money because they're getting mentorship. Hello, internship. That's what it is when you think about it. And even in an internship, you're going to negotiate. I mean, I'm seeing more and more contracts where we're negotiating some things in those things to get it up. Uh, what can we negotiate? How about extra? What if I pick up an extra shift? I got student loans to pay off. How does that work? You can negotiate all those things, okay? This next one, when you, you start thinking about it, try to get them to make the first move. Like I usually tell my students, it is an absolute cat and mouse game. And if you practice this a little bit, it can actually be kind of fun. I understand that your life, your salary is all depending on it. It doesn't sound like fun, Glenn, but, but if you relax a little bit, understand it is. And when I talk about a cat and mouse game, you definitely don't want to make the first move here. You don't want to come out across and be, you know, because an owner is going to try to get you to do that. An owner is going to come across and say, well, how much are you looking to make? I usually always joke and, and with my students and say, why don't you come across and say, well, how much are you looking to pay? Uh, is usually the way I would try to answer that question. And then follow that up with, you know, I did some research. AVMA salary calculator based on the state, based in a small animal practice, says I should be making about 105 and change. I did some other work and, and talked to some other associates and they were making about 120 their first year out plus production and leave it hang out there and see what that owner comes back with. Okay, so don't back yourself in that corner. You don't wanna throw a solid figure out there. And then again, if you've done your homework, you can keep that negotiation moving and kind of talking about some different things. Get the salary discussed. Now let's move on to the next thing. Benefits, what do you guys offer? What's there? Again, uh, as we use health insurance as an example, do they cover 100% of your expenses for health insurance? Probably not. A lot of them will do a 50-50, maybe 70-30 split. Some places don't do any. Well, if they're not going to do any health insurance, you need to go back to salary and say, well, we need to work this equation a little bit. I need to be making more money to cover my health insurance. Okay. And again, you can leverage that with some other contracts and some other things down there too as you go about uh, doing those things. So as we talk about negotiations, and I, I literally just threw this one in here real quick because I literally did this talk with my students today. Um, things to think about, we focus on compensation. But what are some other things? Duties, how is that going to work? Can you pick up emergency relief work? A lot of us have student loans. You've, you've negotiated a contract. You know what your set salary is, but you're on pro sale. Can I pick up an extra couple of shifts? I promise you there's not very many owners out there going to argue that. How are you getting paid for that? Okay, your work schedule, three days, four days, five days a week, the benefits. This is the other part of this equation. What's in there? Are they going to cover animals and services there? Are they going to any discounts? There's your insurance. How about licenses in the practice? Do they cover those? How about CE? Where's those numbers sitting? But based on the contracts I've read this year, about 60, 65 of them, CE's running between 15 or 1500 and $2,000. Retirement packages. We've already heard a little bit about that. You can negotiate some, some of those percentages. And if you can't and they don't offer one, you need to go back to the salary side. Well, can I get more salary because I've got to be looking out for my retirement in the future? Vacation holiday, vehicle policies, relocation signing bonuses. Watch those. I always encourage students to just go down the signing bonus plan. Okay, try to stay away from relocation because if you do relocation, they're going to want receipts. And then they're only going to fund you for based on exactly what it took you to move. So if they're offering you five grand on this one, roll that sucker back into a signing. I understand y'all are giving me 20,000 for sinus, 5,000 to relocate. Can we just do 25 and call it square? And then watch your fine print, negotiate, you know, how these sinus and sinus bonuses work. Watch some of your corporate entities right now. They're offering 80,000, 75, 80,000. Never thought I'd see the day. Read the fine print. It's going to take you three years to get all of it. You know, so watch those kind of things, too. Um, and sometimes you can negotiate those things down. Cell phones, computers, um, non-compete, non-solicitation clauses, watch those. And again, uh, these these things, too, I should tell you, as you negotiate and bargain these things, these titles are usually going to be on that letter of intent. And then that letter of intent evolves into this contract. A letter of intent is going to be a page. It's going to have just a few little bullets listed on there, what you guys negotiated and agreed to, whether during the interview process or during those emails going back and forth or potential text messages. Contracts roll into pages. And in those contracts, you might talk about a non-compete. You know, hey, doc, what's this going to be like? 10 miles, 24 months? Okay, that's your bullet. 
But then all of a sudden in that literal contract, you get a, a few weeks after that letter of intent, here are the pages and everything's listed out. You know, the territory has got to be defined, the time defined, you know, make sure that all those little fine prints and details are in there. You can't own this much, you can't do this, you can't talk to this, you can't do, that's how all that comes in that contract. Look at that. I warn my students about the non-solicitation. This one doesn't have a distance. You just can't solicit clients, people, any of that kind of stuff. Make sure you understand that. And sometimes you can negotiate some of those timeframes down. Um, watch the terms and termination in there, dates of employment, you can negotiate those. I always encourage students to kind of focus on a year. I'm seeing contracts they're trying to tie you in for three. They're either working that on the bonus side of it, or they're just saying, hey, this thing will auto renew. And what they're hoping is just kind of let that thing sit there. I, I, I usually don't encourage that. I would love to see you guys renegotiating this about every year. I encourage my, my students going out in that first year to have an evaluation, a performance review at three months, six months, month 10, enter your negotiation month 11. And by that three, six and 10 month, you're sitting there asking that owner expectations. Give me mentorship. Tell me what I need to be doing. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? Check those boxes. So in month 11, you negotiate this new contract and you're able to say, I've done these things. I've improved here. My, my income to the clinic or my production has improved. So watch those things. Again, you can negotiate all those things as well. So that was just the preparation, things to think about. You need to probably do your homework in each one of those points, okay? And understand what are the going rates and how that really works. From there, once you've collected all that information, and yes, it takes time, now you're ready to open that part of the negotiation. And when you look at that, that's networking. Um, you know, you've already probably done a good bit of that. That's communication. Then you set up the appointments. You go to, to meet the, the doctor, visit the clinic. At that location, that's where the conversation involves into bargaining. You've done your homework. You've done your math. I tell my students to have a little notepad with them. They know what their points are. You want to make sure during that interview process or that bargaining phase, you've hit those points. Don't come out and blur them all in the first 10 minutes. If you're going to be there for a few hours negotiating and bargaining. You can hit all those things. That evolves into that letter of intent. That letter of intent bullets, this is what we've talked about. You have time to think about that. Um, yes, it looks good. Initial doc, send me the contract. And that's the closure part of it, okay? That kind of leads me into this contract thing, just to kind of touch on that. And what do I teach here? A contract is nothing more than agreement between two parties consisting of a mutual promise that the law will enforce, okay? Or recognize as a duty. First thing I always kind of work with my students, written or verbal. Everybody wants written. Is it a good idea? Glenn's 100% for it. Does it have to be? Not necessarily. Okay. It can be a verbal. I deal in a lot of rural practices. A lot of these rural veterinarians, they just do handshakes. A lot of students get iffy about that. I don't feel very good about that. I understand. But guess what? If it's verbal, there's no non-compete. There's no non-solicitation. You haven't signed any of those things. If they don't pay you the six figures they promised, quietly look for another job. So it kind of works that way, but I do understand. And I actually do kind of lean toward, I'd rather have it in writing. Um, so, but just know that exists out there. So not having one doesn't mean you don't have to do it. When you look at the five elements that I teach for, for a contract, this is what a judge will look at to make sure that they're all been there. You have the offer, the acceptance, meeting of the minds, intent to contract and consideration. Okay, the meeting of the minds, the intent to contract, they kind of fall into one situation. You, obviously, you've intended to contract, you've contacted them, you've engaged in these conversations, meeting of the minds, the offer, letter of intent, or the contract that you looked at, you accept it, that's your signature, consideration, that's why they call it a signing bonus, y'all. They're paying you to sign that contract that makes it completely legally binding if you really want to look at it, think about it that way. That's how that works, okay? So when you look at the parts of a contract, just really quick, it always starts with the recitals. The owner, when I want to hire you, you're going to be a vet. This is, a, this is the job of the, this is the title of the clinic. It's an LLC, whatever, whatever. And because we agree on these things as we prepare, we mutually agree, we enter in this agreement. And then the agreement goes into all those things that I listed earlier that you can actually negotiate on some of those. The employment, the terms, the duties, the compensation, the benefit, these are going to be the bullets that you're going to be negotiating, uh, that you're going to be looking at in this contract. Okay, what happens with the non-compete, non-solicitation? What if we breach a contract? How is it assigned? What if things don't line up? Does it negate the whole contract? Those kind of things. 
Um, always think about the entire agreement. Anything in, in most of these written long contracts, if you've agreed to it verbally and they give you the written and it's not in there, it's done because of that point, the entire agreement deal. And I've seen a number of those this year where students have come to me and said, well, here's a compensation. They said they, there was gonna be no negative accrual, but it's in the contract. So I, you know, and then you see that entire agreement clause and it's like, well, it says here that nothing else is on the table. It's just what's in this agreement. So you need to go back and talk to them and negotiate that back out or have that cleared up or add what we call an addendum to the contract, which is a few sentences saying, hey, scratch this out of the contract or this is our new agreement both parties sign it and it's legally binding. All right, so again, just trying to kind of go through this stuff pretty quick. Um, here's just this splash of paycheck. So you've negotiated, do your homework, make sure you're ready to have these conversations when you interview um, or talking. We've talked about how this kind of evolves in this letter of Ted and into this contract. So now we know what we're getting paid and that's gonna come in a paycheck. And I talk to students that sometimes say, well, Glenn, I'm getting $100,000, divide that by 12, that's my monthly income, I'm good. Hold the phone. What about that's your gross amount? So this I tell my sister, kind of like looking at a PL, a, a profit and loss statement. You got the gross, that's the total up on top, but there's going to be deductions that come out of that. And this is just an example of a paycheck stub from Auburn University. It clearly kind of lays everything out on how that works. Paychecks are going to be broken down into this gross amount. That's how much you made. Then there's usually an earnings section that tells you where that money comes from. You're not gonna see that in too many clinics, but you could potentially see this in corporate as they break it down on, this was your base, this is your production-based bonus or commission as I like to call it. It may be listed there on how that works. And then you get down to into this paycheck where you have the benefits, deductions, and taxes. And this is important to understand that there's a way to take money out before taxes to reduce your taxable income. Those are called the deductions, the, the 403 or 401k retirement plans. You're taking money out, putting in a retirement, you're deferring that tax for later. So Uncle Sam doesn't tax you on that right away. Any dental expenses, health insurances that's tied into your to the, that business, part of that compensation equation, well, there they are. They're gonna pull that out of your paycheck. The, the clinic pays some of it, you pay some of it. That's gonna show up on your check. There's flex spending, another way to defer a little bit of money and, and pay less taxes. Um, Again, retirements, those are the things, those are the primary things that you can kind of pull out. From there, Uncle Sam, now, whatever that new monthly total is, now Uncle Sam wants to come in and take their part, okay? The feds are going to come in and take theirs. FICA, Medicare, again, federal stuff comes in there. Then you've got the state, if state has income tax, okay? Y'all know that some do. Alabama, for example, does. Florida, Texas, I think Tennessee, some of those don't. So you don't have to worry about it. I usually joke with my students, don't don't run and, and, and pack up and move to one of those states because you're thinking, well, they don't have income tax. That's great. Yeah, but I promise you that they've got a higher um, property tax. So Uncle Sam going to get his money. Okay, so watch how that works. And then after that, you got deductions after. So if there's any extra life insurance, any other things that the clinic or the corporate entity or someone wants to offer, they'll take that money out. And what's left after that is going to be how much goes in your checking account. And that's going to be the net. The gross amount is the total, take out your deductions, taxes come out, and then what you got left, anything extra, then you have your net. Folks, this is what goes in your bank account now, okay? That is what you need to be budgeting. So I'm kind of coming back full circle to, to that. Um, here you go, again, just so you guys kind of see how this broke is broken down, but uh, I just went through that. The only other thing I want to mention here, and I'll wrap it up and, and, and hand it over to, to Donna is, um, when we're talking about these federal tax brackets, what I want you guys to hear from me, it, it is a progressive tax system, okay? I hear it from people all the time. Well, I don't wanna make, I don't wanna raise because it's gonna throw me in a higher tax bracket. No, 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 no. It's gonna move you into a higher tax bracket on the difference of that money that you make, depending on where you fall. If you look at this and try to understand that, understand this, there's seven tax brackets at the moment, 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, and 37. When you look at it, anyone that makes between zero and roughly $9,950 as a single filer, you pay 10% tax. Then it moves to anything between 9,951 and 40, you pay 2%, you pay 12 on that or 2% more if you wanna look at it that way. And then it just kind of works its way up. So those of us that are hopefully, based on the numbers I'm seeing out of this class, are going to be making around 100 to start plus 22% production, you should be looking at somewhere, okay, we'll make around 100. 
So between zero to 9,000, I pay 10. I pay 2% more. Uh, between this difference, I pay a considerable amount more here. And, and then when I get to the, to the 24, in between that 100, I'm going to pay 2% more off the 22. So understand that that tax scale kind of slides up as you go. You're not paying 24% because you make $100,000. And that's something that's always been a little pet peeve of mine that I want people to understand when they're looking at their taxes and figuring that out where that's going to slide into this box right here. Okay. When the, when the uncle Sam comes to figure this out. And one other thing as I wrap up here, you are going to pay these taxes in understand it's important to tax plan and have all that stuff together. So you get your refund back, you know, between January and April of next year. So you got to think about those things. So with that, Again, I'll be hang around for any questions after, um, and I, I'll hand it off to Donna. If you're on there, Dr. Harris, you here? Yep, I'm here, but you have to stop your screen share. Yep, we'll do. All right, there you go. So I will try to be quick. We're a little bit over, I know, um, but I will. Hmm. My screen share is being funky, so I'll go back here and try this again. There we go. All right. So you have figured out the best way to repay your loans and decide what goes into retirement. You've negotiated a great contract. Uh, you've figured out a budget. And now you're thinking to myself, to yourself, uh, do I need a financial advisor? You're out of practice. You're making a little bit of money do I need a, uh, a financial advisor? So we're gonna talk about this for just a few minutes as fast as I can without spinning your heads. And so I'm gonna start by saying, what are they? Do you need one? If you decide yes, then how do you pick one and what to expect? If you decide no, what are your options? And the reason I say you is because it is up to you, all right? And we'll talk about a little bit about that why. All right, so let's let's step back a minute and talk about financial advisors. So financial advisor is a self-titled, a self-made description for somebody who's choosing to be in that field. And they go by a variety of titles. So they could be a financial, or they may say wealth, financial planner, financial strategist, wealth planner, wealth strategist, or consultant, or specialist, or associate, or advisor, or advisor. All right, they can have specific areas of expertise. They can just do retirement planning. Say I'm a retirement strategist. I only work on planning for college funding. I only work to help people with their student loan repayment programs. I only work with people who are in divorce situations, all right? So we call these lifestyle or stages of life planners. So the titles are not assigned to them by any government, or federal agency, these are self-determined titles. So there are financial advisors in certain classes that are regulated by either federal or state. So if you're talking to somebody who's selling you an insurance policy as a product, right? They are regulated. In order to sell insurance products, they have to be regulated. If they're selling investments like mutual funds or EFTs, there's regulation. Or if they're selling stocks and bonds, they're a security broker. Those are regulated, all right? There are certain other definitions to understand. And the first one is what I call suitability. So certain financial insurance investment security brokers, they will sell a product and they're allowed to sell a product <coughs> if it is suitable, in quotes, for the client or the situation. That is different than being a fiduciary. A fiduciary advisor is, means that they only give advice or sell products and it must be in the client's best interest. So that is different than being suitable. And so you'll have to decide is suitability okay with you for a financial advisor that's working in the suitability market? or are they a fiduciary? Let's talk about what we mean by financial products. We tend to think about financial products as anything that money is used to purchase 
that affects your financial future. So we talk about investments. You've heard the word stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or what they call EFTs, exchange traded funds. These are all things that are beyond the scope of this quick talk, but this is just, this is kind of financial jargon, all right? So when you started veterinary school, you didn't understand all the veterinary jargon, right? But you went to school and you've learned that. You can learn financial jargon too. So we don't want any financial advisor using financial jargon saying, oh, well, you can't understand this, but let me tell you, this is right for you, right? You can understand this. For gosh sakes, you can do surgery. You can learn and understand financial jargon. So it, uh, insurance investments, annuities, life insurance, both term and whole, and long-term care insurance that is sometimes tied to life insurance. This is all financial products. Uh, and then disability, long and short term. We think about that as insurance, but it's also something that we exchange money for that will affect our financial future. So we call those financial products. And these are the types of things that financial advisors and insurance salesmen that are also financial, calling themselves financial advisors, this is what they're selling you. Now, let's briefly talk for a minute, how do financial advisors get compensated? And many financial advisors are very good and they deserve to be compensated just like you deserve to be fairly compensated like Glenn was talking about. But you need to understand how they're compensated. So sometimes these advisors, brokers, investors are compensated by commissions or like production, just like you could be on a production base, right? So when you buy a fund, there's a load to it. So for example, you may say, here's $10,000 to invest in this fund, but your actual investment is only $9,500 because 5,000 of that goes to the financial advisor as a load or a, a front end commission, all right? Insurance brokers, they get um, a percentage of the policies they sell. Some of them that even get a percentage of each time you pay for a policy. There's also financial advisors that are paid by AUM, which is assets under management. So as you do Jorge's investment strategy and you're sitting out there 20 and 30 years and you have $2 million in your retirements, if those are sitting under the guidance of a financial advisor, they get a percentage of that every year. And that can be anything from 2% to 15%. So whether they buy, trade, or do anything with that, they get a percentage. And it doesn't matter whether your investments go up or down, they still get their percentage. And that's called assets under management. Now, that percentage may change whether it goes up or down. But these are the details you need to understand when you pick a financial advisor. Now, some advisors only sell their time and they will work on an hourly basis or they may work by the project. Let's say that I'm thinking about retiring in the next couple of years. So I want to hire a financial advisor to look at all my retirement funds and give me a plan for how I might retire. Right. So that financial advisor is working by the project. So what about picking a financial advisor? Let's say you say, yes, I want a financial advisor. And here's why we normally think of go out and get recommendations. Here's the problem with that. My financial goals and your financial goals may certainly be different. And unless we have an in-depth discussion about what my financial goals are and what yours are goals are and our risk tolerance, then what I might want for a financial advisor is not necessarily what you want from an advisor. So it's, it's not that you can't ask people who they use, but you definitely need to take it with a grain of salt unless you really know them quite well. So know your goals, know what you value, and know, understand your risk tolerance. And only then can you decide which financial products are going to be good for you? So your goals will define the type of plans that a financial advisor or you decide to make. Am I saving for 
uh, my child's college fund. Well, is my child one year old or 11 years old? These are different plans depending on how long you have, all right? And those plans will only determine the products you use, but the products have to fit into what you value. You might not value the same thing as your financial advisor, but they still need to do what within your values. So let's talk briefly about risk. And we alluded to some of this, the other speakers did. There are four types of risk I want you to just kind of think about, all right? Market risk, individual investment risk, purchasing power risk or inflation, and liquidity risk. And we're gonna whip through this, all right? So market risk. Well, if you pay attention to anything that's going on in the last week, which I know with your classes, sometimes it's hard to, but the market is a little bit crazy right now, right? But the market affects everything we do. Whether you have money in a bank and think that it's very secure, the prices we pay, the gas prices we pay, everything is affected by the market. In a capitalist economy, which we live in, we are all affected by the market. Goes up, goes down. So we can't get rid of market risk. But there's purchasing power risk. I thought I skipped one here. So we're not gonna talk about this because this is inflation. And your first speaker already talked about inflation when he talked about you know, uh, the time value of money. A dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow if inflation is going up. And then there's individual investment risk. Now where I choose to put my money I might choose it, I might be comfortable with more risk with my individual investments than Glenn is. I don't know Glenn you know, real well personally, so I don't know how risky he is. But I want you to remember that your individual investment risk is not the same thing as the risk you might think of for your personality. So for example, just because you like to take risky, crazy vacations or engage in a little bit of risky sports and extracurricular activities doesn't necessarily mean you want your money to be at risk. And if you go online, there's all sorts of what they call risk tolerance quizzes. And if you wanna email me, I use some in my classes, I can send you some, but, but you can just Google, you know, quizzes for determining your risk tolerance. And a good financial advisor, if you choose to use one, will, determine what your risk tolerance is and then sell you investments and our financial products that are in line with your risk tolerance. Liquidity risk is just how fast you need the money. If I'm saving for something I'm going to buy in a year, I need that money available to me. So I don't want to use that money to say buy an apartment building as an investment right? Because in a year that apartment building value may go up or down and I can't I might not have the same amount of money. That, and I have to wait for a buyer to buy that apartment building. And so that's not very liquid. But if I put it in the bank and I need it, I can get it right out, that's liquid. So those are the kind of risks that you need to think about. And that if you choose to use a financial advisor, uh, they need to understand your risk level and make sure that your plans are in line with that. So what are some decent places to find uh, advisors? Well, here are three um, really good networks or associations that you can use to try to find some personal financial advisors. Now there is, there is at least seven different certifications that somebody interested in being a financial advisor could uh, study for and take an exam for. And again, beyond the scope of the time we have here, but worth researching if you talk to somebody or interview them as a financial advisor, understand what the initials mean behind their name. It could be something where they you know, bought a certificate, but it, there's also a couple of them that are quite difficult to get. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that financial advisor is a good fit for you, but it certainly means they likely have some good uh, financial knowledge. So what if you decide at least for a while you're gonna do your own thing. Well, here's a couple of ways to get started. There's a great book out there called A Simple Path to Wealth. 
at Michigan State, we do a book club of this a couple times a year. We have an alumni that's donated these books for the students that are interested. It's a great first book. Get yourself oriented. It's still a good book, even if you want to use a financial advisor, because it teaches you some of that financial jargon I talked about. Of course, there's podcasts out there like crazy. A real popular one is Choose FI. FI stands for Financial Independence. And then there's another one called the White Coat Investor. It was started some years ago, primarily focusing on um, physicians, but they've since turned uh, some attention toward veterinarians and it has uh, some good advice on it. And if you really got into investing, there's the American Association of Individual Investors. They have newsletters, they have a conference. Uh, it's a way to get uh, more knowledgeable and, and meet other people who are doing their own investments. So again, I'm not here to, um, persuade you to do one thing or the other, but I do wanna leave you with these last little bewares. Beware of people, organizations, selling money products by offering you student loan repayment assistance. Because of the attention that veterinary medicine received several years ago when the debt crisis really became known, a lot of the financial uh, industry paid attention. Veterinarians do have a student debt problem, but they eventually come out of it and they do quite well. And so there are some less than scrupulous companies and players out there swooping into veterinary schools and to new grads saying, I can help you with your student loan repayment plans and give you advice. Oh yeah. And also here's some products to buy. Here's some life insurance to buy. Here's some disability to buy. All right. You must have these products. And you must have them now or the price will go up. So beware of anybody who's selling you any financial product with pressure that if you don't buy today, the price will go up. Be sure you understand the product or the investment you're making. If you don't understand it, don't invest in it. You all are smart. Like I said, you can do surgery. <laughs> you can understand financial jargon. And that wraps up. That is a quick and dirty financial advice for you. So I think we're gonna open it up to question, is that right? Yeah, thank you all so much for your individual presentations. We'll go ahead and open it up for questions um, right now. And if you wanna direct questions at a specific person, go ahead. Otherwise, if you have general questions, I'm sure any one of them will be willing to answer if they're able to. Dr. Colon, I don't know if you wanted to address Roth IRAs a little bit more while we're waiting for maybe some questions to trickle in. Yeah, I can do that. And I was going to uh, support something that Donna says about the importance for you to understand this jargon because the students that think that they need to get a financial advisor because they don't know what they're talking about. The problem is that if you don't learn what they're going to be talking to you about, then you don't know what that person's recommending you talking about. So therefore, you still need to learn what they're talking about, even though you didn't know what you were talking about. So you still need to get educated and learn this jargon, even if you think you can't do it on your own, because otherwise you're flying blind and letting somebody else do something with your money. And at the end of the day, they have theirs, but you don't have yours. So even if you want to have a financial advisor, you still need to learn what it is that they're doing for you. So like Dr. Harris says, you have to get yourself educated and make a decision that fits what you want, um, what you need based on your needs. Um, I'll address the question about the Roth IRAs. Again, I'm not a financial advisor. Um, a Roth IRA is a individual retirement account where you contribute post-tax dollars that grow compounded over time and for most part, they're tax-free withdrawals in the future. I have learned in my older age something that my younger self did not do. And that is really dependent on the amount of money that you have at the time when you need to pay your tax bill on April 15, like Glenn was referring to. In the past, I was in a scenario where it was more beneficial for me 
to contribute to a traditional retirement account or to my own personal 401k because I was self-employed so I could reduce my taxable income to increase my cash flow. Now that I'm older, I realize that that 1200 bucks here, 1400 bucks there, compared to the value of that retirement account 20 years later, it would have been a lot better to pay that tax back then that I will have to pay when the tax when I start withdrawing that account in the future. So I am a really big proponent of Roth IRAs. I have them. I just don't have enough money on them as I would want to have in them. I'd rather have money that won't pay taxes in the future than money that will, but both are good to go. But the concept of the Roth IRA is if you think that your tax rate in the future is going to be lower than or greater than, who knows? Nobody knows that. And you're going to be starting in a scenario where, like Glenn explained on his tax tables, you guys are probably going to be where your last dollars of earnings are going to be paying at a 24% tax bracket. And unless you're somewhere close to the line between one tax bracket and the other one, that amount of money that you're going to be saving in interest is going to be related to 24%. So if you're going to contribute five grand, five grand times 24 percent, that's what you're going to be saving in taxable dollars if you contribute to a um, tax deferred account. But if you can afford that tax hit and pay the tax now, then you have that five thousand dollars growing into the future, compounding tax free at the end. And so I'm a huge proponent of Roth IRAs. I love them. Um, if you work at any point in time while you're in your school years and you make what is it, twelve thousand dollars before you have to file taxes then I'll put that money into a Roth account because you are going to pay taxes on that amount. Your taxable income is 0%. So you're going to pay taxes on it. It's just that it's zero and you can put it into a Roth account. My daughter worked this last summer and every dollar that she worked during working went straight into a Roth account. And y'all, so y'all know there's no rule on, on when you look at retirement investing it, and we're talking about Roths or 401ks, it's, it's not that you can do one or the other. You can actually do both. Um, so you can have a traditional 401k and contribute to it, which is going to be pre-tax dollars. And you can have that Roth, which is post-tax. And if you're able to do it, I encourage you to do both because um, you're limited on your Roth at, at 6,000 single 12,000 uh, joint. So if you're able to throw it over in that Roth, 6,000, throw the leftover in the 401k, your traditional one, do both. Um, highly encouraged to do that. Glenn, there's a question for you in the chat. Let's see what we got. Um, oh, contract negotiation, students going through the match for rotating internships. Um, have any of you experienced students being able to negotiate those contracts? Are they pretty hard set? Um, you have, they're pretty hard set. So there's not a whole lot of wiggle room in those. Um, what you can negotiate is outside of that contract a little bit if you're looking to make extra money, because as we know, internships usually don't pay very well. Okay. So what I've seen on some of these um, is that you're able to get your 35, 40, I've seen some at 50,000, and then you're able to pick up some extra shifts after doing some of the training in these internship um, experiences. Um, so, but the majority of that is pretty well, pretty hard set. The only ones that I've seen some Michigan State students negotiate is the equine internships, which are primarily at private practices. And those I've seen students be able to negotiate a little bit with, um, but you're right that normally the ones in the private referral hospitals and the academic institutions are pretty hard set, but those equine ones might be worth having a look at. And I've been surprised this year, I've seen some of the small animal privates that they've been a little bit more flexible. Again, I don't know if it's because they're really trying to get people in the door or what. And that's just been this year. It's been kind of crazy this year. But but you're you're right, Dr. Harris. I mean, that's usually the equine ones are a little bit more flexible. These small animal ones, after you've been there for a little bit, they feel comfortable cutting you loose in some cases. They'll let you pick up some emergency shifts and they'll pay you extra on those. I did hear a conversation at a conference just this fall that said that one of the largest corporations was going to up their interns to over 40,000, that they've had it with these, you know, that was ridiculously low. Now I have not seen that in writing, uh, but I know that that's, that's been talked about by one of the large corporation who does a lot of internships in private uh, referral practices. I saw one this year, most of them hover in the 30s, 32s, 35s. I saw one this year that was 50, um, private. Okay emergency 
um, initially, and okay. then you're ro rotating around that clinic. Um, first one I've seen, only one I've seen so far. Okay. I mean, supply and demand, just like you guys are saying, the, the students who are going through this rotating matching internships, those are where you have 50 students competing for those five spots and those employers can offer you whatever they want to because there's 45 others that will take it. When you get to the equine world, which is my world, and there are no how many enough people, so they got to open their wallets to make that happen. And on the private side, it's a lot easier always to do that on the corporate side. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Mindy, your question about debt, this, this gets a little bit complicated. So in, in, in a straight out fashion, the best loan to pay down first is the one that with the highest interest rate. Now, some people will say, pay the smallest amount first because that way you feel more satisfied that you actually accomplished something. There's a million different psychological reasons of which one to pay first or not. But this gets really complicated because the way that your loans get packaged together at the end of your education, you better be really careful of how they get packaged and who packages them because you could make your loans still being eligible for potential future um, loan forgiveness. There's a million things you need to go through the financial aid person at the school and they will be able to guide you properly. Um, these loans that are packaged in a specific way, when you make a payment, they just go divide it equally into all your loans. You don't get to pick which one you're paying off. And if you do that, you're probably in a private loan scenario. And if you take a federal unsubsidized student loan into a private scenario, then you run away of the program, especially one for student um, loan forgiveness. So do not make any harsh consolidations or anything like that after graduation, unless you speak with somebody who has your best interest, a fiduciary, like Donna mentioned, for you, not the person who's trying to sell you the product or that consolidated loan. That person is not, does not have your best interest on hand. I recommend that every single one of you, if you have an employer that does matching, you at least, at minimum, you have to contribute the amount that would elicit the maximum employer's match. That is the minimum because that's free money. After that, your budget will dictate how much more you can or you cannot save. But don't, don't put away the ability to make free money that will compound over time when your employer will match it. So you have to look at that. That has to be part of your budget. Even if you're drowning in student debt, don't give away free money. Because if you, if you like the graph I show, if you wait until five years later, when you have a little bit more money, because now you're making more money to start investing, you just can't catch up. You can't catch up. You cannot make those five years back. if you work in, again, this is budget stuff. If you work in your living expenses and those kind of things, if you look at it simply from that, I always tell my students three to six months, you should have in a savings account in case job changes, something, you know, that you didn't plan for. So whatever the rent is, whatever the house payment is, what, you know, you try to keep three to six months, put away in a savings account, make sure you've got that emergency fund there. Um, again, it always works in that budgeting thing. Um, you know, having having some downtime, taking vacation, you want to budget for those things to where every paycheck you can put a little bit towards that while you still manage your student loans. And, and you know, what we talked about earlier with investing, I mean, you want to manage your student loan debt, but you need to be thinking about the future, too. Um, so you want to budget and balance those things in my mind. Any other questions? Because I know we did run a little over 8 p.m. and I don't want to keep people too long. And this recording will be put up on the SAVMA YouTube at in the next week or so. Seeing and hearing no questions, we'll go ahead, go ahead and end this for the evening. Thank you again, all three of you for speaking with us. This was really beneficial and I'm sure that a lot of students got a lot from it and hopefully people will watch the recording as well since that will be available to them. So have a great rest of your evening, everybody, and have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank y'all.